Welcome. My name is Paul Mitchell. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Agriculture and Applied Economics here at the University of Wisconsin. I'm also an Extension State Specialist in UW Extension and Cropping Systems Management. I'm also director of the Rank Agribusiness Institute and co-director of Nutrient Pest Management um, of the Nutrient Pest Management Program. I'm here today to talk about crop budgets and marketing plans as an overall program we are putting out here in UW Extension for grain management considerations in low margin years. What I'm going to do in this set of slides is go through four big issues. I'm going to present a bunch of evidence to discuss and demonstrate how the farm economy is under stress. Um, and the second one will be some simple examples of marketing plans that a farmer can do. The third part will be the importance of knowing your cost of production. And then the last part will be um, talking about partial budging as a tool for low margin years. It's actually a very good tool for many years and we'll talk about it. This slide shows um, USDA data on the net farm income over the last several years here um, in the U.S. This is for all agriculture, all the crops, all the farming, um, livestock, dairy, etc. This is all at the national level and it shows a projection of the $67 billion here for the 2016 marketing year. And it's still a forecast at this time. And you can see it's the third year in a row it's been declining and it's very low where it's been several years ago, uh, back in 2009. These are cash receipts for selected crops. So this would be the revenue coming into farms. You can see corn has been decreasing four years in a row. Soybeans has been down for several years and we had an uptick last year. Fruit and nuts have been dropping the last couple of years. Vegetables and melons flat. Wheat, three years, of, four years of decline. Cotton flat. Um, focusing in on Wisconsin here though, um, you see this is um, net farm income, or I'm sorry, cash receipts from um, um, corn. And what you see here is how it's been dropping. But last year, it's relatively flat, um, roughly the same as it was in 2015. And what really drove this is our state record yield. We had 178 bushels per acre, which is 14 bushels more than it was in 2015. And even at 350 a bushel, that's about almost $50 an acre. And so I've talked to a lot of county extension agents and some of the bankers in the state, and that extra, just the massive yields have really helped a lot of farmers cash flow this year. Um, you see the same thing here in soybeans is um, we had another state record yield, 55 bushels per acre, um, which is five and a half bushels more than in 2015. And even five and a half bushels at $9 an acre, or I'm sorry, $9 a bushel is again, almost $50 an acre. So that cash receipts from soybeans in the state were actually up over 2015. But the, that, that extra cash, that extra 50 bucks an acre compared to last year is the average for the state really helped a lot of farmers. And the, the worry I have personally is you can't expect two record years in a row. I'm looking at margins here. Um, these are data from um, Northern Illinois, um, which is again, very similar to um, Southern Wisconsin. These are projected full cost of production as a, um, as a converted to dollars per bushel top is corn, the bottom is soybeans. This is over the last several years um, since 2008. The University of Illinois has a very consistent program and been doing this for um, over a decade. And so what I like about this is it's the same method used year after year. What you see in red is the cost per bushel and in green is the expected farm price. Both of these are the expected costs in the fall. So like the one there for 2017 crop year is actually in the fall of 2016, October, November is when these projections are made. What you see is the red above the green, meaning negative margins were expected for corn every, since 2013. Soybeans margins are negative again and um, still um, much smaller, um, almost positive. Um, and that's, you can see the um, estimates there, um, almost a 90 cent um, gap for corn and um, 33 cent per bushel gap for soybeans. These are projected prices back in the fall. You can see the soybean prices are better that right now, if you looked at those projections, I, yeah, I think you'd see a positive margin. Um, again, the other thing to note is these are the full cost of production, paying $258 an acre for land rent, paying the farmer a fair wage is the idea um, for management of the land. And so my guess for Wisconsin is that the range 420 to 460 is a good guess for captures a large chunk of our farmers for corn. For soybeans, somewhere in that range of 920 to 960 captures that full cost of production for a lot of Wisconsin farmers. Um, this is data from the, um, it shows the, um, from the Federal Reserve Banks. It shows um, real estate loan um, demand, or I'm sorry, non-real estate loan demand, it, it, the operating loans really, or for machinery and building expansion and such. And you can see over the last several years, 2013 through 2016, in the fourth quarter. So think of it as farmers going in and getting operating loans to help buy the inputs for the, the oncoming year, um, 2017 in this case. 
And what you really see is the farm loan demand has dropped off dramatically um, overall for non-real estate loans. You can see it broken into the various categories there. But and I've talked to some of the bankers around the state I've been meeting with over the last few weeks. And in general, it's pretty obvious. It's a mix of lower input prices. Fertilizer prices have really come down. Um, fuel prices are low. Cattle prices are down. Um, there's a lot of this operating loans nationally is, is um, for buying feeder cattle. Um, but also farmers are cutting back on input purchases, buying less fertilizer, buying less fuel, buying less seed or lower cost seed. Um, and the other one is lenders aren't giving out as much money as they used to. I've, my understanding is there are bankers that um, have been dealing with farmers that are just not giving them as large operating loan as they're used to or would like to have. And you can see that in these data. This one now is um, Federal Reserve data. Um, and what this is as well is delinquency and bankruptcy in the state of Wisconsin since 2001. Um, and the, the, I'm highlighting those last few years here since um, 2012, um, 2013. What you see is a big spike up right after the Great Recession um, in some of that stuff when a lot of these farms would have been somebody had another full-time job or part-time job and were subsidizing their farming operation. And then when unemployment spiked, a lot of these farms had trouble um, maintaining cash flow on their operating and or mortgages for their operating loans and mortgages. And so what you see is there was a big uptick in um, loan delinquencies, either on the real estate or on the operating loans. And, but what's happened since then is they've fallen back to historical levels. Um, you really look at the delinquencies on the non-real estate ag loans, the operating loans, if you will, it's essentially zero and been that way since 2012. Another contributing factor to this is that the fact that banks under a lot more rules um, as a result of the Great Recession um, and the, the lending rules that were put into place, they're really not allowed to lend money under this as easily as they used to be able to. Um, if they don't see a way for farmers to cash flow and able to repay that loan, they, they're not really allowed to loan it um, or lend it. And so you really see that in these data. And what that means is I, I think, what I think it means is there are farmers out there who are not getting operating loans like they expect. And um, the banks are putting farmers under a lot of pressure to only get the loan that they think they can repay. So what I really put this down in a summary is there's lots of indicators that farmers are financially stressed by these negative margins that have been existing for a while. But so far, most farmers are managing it in the sense that we're not seeing a big run up in debt to asset ratios where there's a crisis happening yet. Our loan delinquency rates are low. The, the banks are not giving loans unless um, they see a viable plan to repay it. And so farmers are using their equity to repay these loans, but that can't continue. Um, there's a lot of operating capital, liquidity is gone, and some of the debt to asset ratios are rising. And it's okay, it's manageable right now for most farmers, but there's definitely a lot of stress out there and longer term, this can't go on. I, I personally see two or three more years of this and we could have a serious ag crisis starting in some areas, particularly I think on the Great Plains. What I wanted to switch to next is our marketing plans. Um, and it's a key part of being, being profitable, if you can be profitable in these low margin years. And what I really like to emphasize is there is no such thing as a right or correct plan. You just it has to fit your style of management and your personality. And it can be as simple as that second bullet there. Buy crop insurance for at least part of my operating loans by July 1st. I'm going to forward price at least my insured production and then market everything else aggressively. That can be your marketing plan. There's a lot of stuff out there and I'm, I'm, there's a couple links here you can see. Um, the UW Madison, or I'm sorry, UW Extension Team Grains has put together a, a program there and it's the link is there. And it's a very broad and full um, program. It goes much more educational. So it allows it, it, it trying to explain why you do certain things. And then Ed Usset, at the, he's at the University of Minnesota Center for Farm Financial Management. He's got a couple things there. He's own stuff on, on the Center for Farm Financial Management's webpage, but there's also the um, article there recently appeared in Corn Soybean Digest. And to be frank, Ed is probably the best in the Midwest at this, um, how to do marketing. He's very much, he doesn't do outlooks and such, but he likes to do, um, he does teach farmers how to do marketing. And so I think he's got some very good materials. What I'm gonna do is kind of go through the UW Extension one, give you a good idea what's there, and then we'll talk about Ed Usset's. Um, so the Team Grains put this stuff together. It's longer and it's more in depth. It covers the philosophy and the strategy, the multiple options are out there and stuff. And so I'm kind of gonna summarize what they are and like I said, its goal is not just to give you the marketing plan, but to give you the education, the story behind it. So step one is sort of inventory, what's out there? What, what can I do from a potential marketing strategies in my situation at the farm I'm in? You know, there's forward cash contracts, basis contracts, I can store it, leave it unpriced, hedge, hedge to arrive contracts, et cetera. 
and it's not necessarily just making a list of what these are, but how can I do them in my community where I live? Who would I go see to do a forward cash contract? What are the options? Um, what, are, what do I need for cash flow to make it happen? If I'm gonna do storage, what are my storage options specifically? How much does it cost if I store it at the co-op, et cetera? It's not just knowing the list, but, but specifically for your operation in your community. Um, they also like to break it up in these marketing horizons. Usually it's pre-harvest, harvest, and post-harvest. Given that we're in the um, area we are now, I like to call it um, pre-plant really is where we are. And so I think that's a time to think about it as a marketing horizon as well. The next step is to um, think about, um, you wanna separate your expected production into marketable units um, and then set pricing objectives for each unit. The UW Extension one likes to use the fifths, 20% um, chunks. So you kind of take maybe your crop insurance and you kind of know what your historical production's been. And now you know your crop insurance guarantee um, or your crop insurance um, production history. And then you choose your guarantee from that, break that into 20% chunks and then start taking each of those 20% and a lot of times you start out with a less aggressive options at the first 20% and then get more and more aggressive, trying to get higher prices for your later options. Then the last thing is setting is, is implementing your plan, which I think the key with it is setting dates and following them. A lot of these marketing plans, it's really, it's all about formalizing decision dates and trying to structure yourself so you make decisions on those dates or before those dates. A big problem farmers have is they keep waiting um, and here it comes, it's November, December, and you've got none of your grain priced because you're waiting for something to happen. Um, what's nice about marketing plans is they're trying to force you to make decisions by certain dates. So here's an example from the, um, the, the first 20%, the, the pre-plant time period, which is what we're in now. Um, this is an example of what the marketing plan in the UW Extension's um, Team Grains um, materials. So plea print. I'm sorry, pre-plant price, the first 20% of expected production when the market price is 20 cents above um, per bushel above your variable cost of production regardless of the market outlook. You get that done by March 1st. If the elevator has a normal to strong basis, I'll just forward contract with them. But maybe the elevator, if elevator has a weak basis, I'll do a hedge to arrive contract and I'll lock in my basis later. Um, I expect the basis to strengthen where uh, it'll, be, um, it'll be better for me, so I'll wait. Um, the other one, if the market is well above your price target, just purchase a put option with the basis adjusted um, strike price equal to your target price. Um, what that's doing is, you know on that 20%, you're locking in the um, with the put option, that price, but you're leaving the upside potential there um, because you, you think the prices are gonna be higher. Um, th that can be that, that simple. Um, you can see it's a little more sophisticated maybe what I'm gonna do now is talk about um, Ed Usset's program here, and he's got this nice little five-step marketing program for pre-harvest time period um, here, and it just recently appeared in the Corn Soybean Digest. So the first one is have a clear objective. Just buy crop insurance to protect my production risk and price 75% of my anticipated soybean production by mid-June. Um, that's, 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 the, that's the marketing plan right there. So set a minimum price and set a maximum price. Minimum is 950 is what he's setting. I, my understanding is he farms as well, and so this is his um, marketing plan. Um, his maximum price is 1250. Um, and the other thing then is to set some dis established decision dates. And it really the key about it is to force your hand. If prices are above your minimum or maximum on those dates, you, you pull the trigger. You don't keep waiting. And the last thing is expect. Your, or I'm sorry, is to select your pricing tool. Um, Early in the season, he likes to stay with the simple ones like a forward or a futures contract. And then as the season goes on, um, you get more aggressive and you get more creative and he starts going into the puts and calls and stuff. And so, um, like I said, if you want something simple, I really recommend looking at Ed's stuff. If you're a little more sophisticated or you want to understand what you're doing, I recommend the UW Extension stuff. So here's more details on it here for what Ed's got laid out. Um, objective, buy crop insurance, protect my production risk. Um, to calculate your, your production based off your APH yield. Um, traditionally, farmers are a little more optimistic than their APH yield, so this is a way to be structured and conservative about it. And he does it in, in just bushel levels, so price 5,000 bushels at 950. It's for him, he's assuming a 75 cent basis, so he wants 1025 November futures using a forward um, contract or futures hedge contract, or a, you, know, you can see the list there. Um, then he's got another 5,000 bushels at 1025 or $11 futures. He's doing that by April 11th. He's not setting the pricing tool yet. He says April is a long ways away. I will pick the tool closer to that time. The key is, is he's got an April 11th trigger date. He's got to make that decision by April 11th. Watches those op futures prices or the local cash prices 
and he'll pick his pricing tool. Um, if he sees that 1025 local cash price, he'll jump on it with that, or he can choose a tool to be determined later. And you can see the other ones are there as well. May 10th is another decision date for another 5,000 con bushel contract, June 9th. Um, and what, what's the other thing there is, um, notice how the plan starts January 1st is when he wrote this up, but the key is ignore these decision dates and make no sale if the prices are lower than that 950 local cash price or the 1025 November futures price. So he's willing to wait, um, but then he's got that June 9th, all right, if nothing's happening, the prices are not working according to my plan, by June 9th, I'm gonna price stuff even if it's below my costs. So he's got their 20 to 40% of production is gonna be priced by June 9th. Um, and I, I think the real key about a marketing plan is to be structured and formalized. It's to have those decision dates and force yourself to sell some of your crop, even, even if prices aren't what you want. Don't keep waiting. The next section here is about estimating your cost of production or knowing your cost of production. And it, in some sense, it's very simple, but it's also very difficult. Um, there's key inputs. The variable inputs are very straightforward. Rent, fertilizer, seed, chemicals, insurance, et cetera. They're all easy to figure out. Look at your records. You're, everyone's doing taxes. You got your Schedule F. You got your numbers there. You got invoices for all this stuff. You can look what you did. You can project ahead. Call the um, local suppliers up and find out the local current prices. And so you got records from your taxes, um, and that's pretty straightforward. Um, and then you put it into a tool. You can do it in a spreadsheet if you want. Uh, I think in, in, in Wisconsin here, Ken Williams is the UW Extension agent in Washera County. Online, he's got a good budget system there, and it's, it's pretty, it's pretty user-friendly. Um, you just put your numbers in the spreadsheet. Or you can make your own spreadsheet, or you can just sit down with pencil and paper. It, it's not that hard um, it, conceptually. It gets a little more detailed, and it's easy to mix up the math. That's what's nice about a spreadsheet. It does all the math for you. And if you make a little change, it recalculates everything. Um, what's hard are the non-cash costs, things like overhead and depreciation, think where you don't leave, you don't have receipts for them. Like how do you pay for the pickup truck? You 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 spend ten thousand dollars on your pickup truck. Where do you allocate that at? That's overhead. Um, depreciation, you know, you got tax depreciation, but it's not always very realistic. Um, and machinery costs are probably the hardest part. And so I what I really say, and I emphasize this in my own class and when I teach the students, is you can only estimate machinery costs. You, you can't really know them until you sell the equipment and then you can calculate what you actually did spend over the, over the course of the um, life of the equipment. And custom rates are a good start though um, to get started. What I'd like to show you here is a slide, it's older from 2006, but I wanna know, it's, a, it's to demonstrate why estimating your cost of production is important. And then the key is your cost of production. This is from Gary Schnitke at the, in, in Illinois. Um, these are from um, Illinois costs of production and this is on a per acre basis for corn and um, for corn. Horizontal axis is percent of the land in corn. So 50% would be a corn soybean rotation. And that's where most of the points are clumped in that area. And these don't have rent in them. So you got to take rent out. And so, um, you know, whatever rent was in two, 2006. But what I really want you to see is how in 2006, some farmers were making $400 an acre to pay for the rent and pay for their own time and, and management effort. Some people were losing $100 an acre. You can see that here, how $400 an acre was a few up there. There's a few losing money. Vast majority of people are around $200 um, per acre. And that's what I really want you to see is how variable the, that cost of production is. And it, what you don't need to know is the average cost of production for a corn farmer in Wisconsin is, you know, like in the example, $200 an acre. What you need to know is which of those dots are you. And only you can do that. I, I can't estimate your cost of production for you. You need to do it yourself. Now this is um, back to 2017's projected shares. And what I wanna focus in on is how land and machinery dominate the cost of production. The left-hand pie chart is for um, corn. The right-hand one is for soybean. The land rent is the same and it's um, $258. And for, for corn, that's 27% that's of, the, of the total cost of production. The second one is machinery at 16%. You go to the, um, the other one, soybeans on the right there, land, the same rental rate is 40%, machinery is 20% of the cost. And you can see the total cost there, almost um, 575 for soybean and um, 839 for corn. And these are for Northern Illinois, those same budgets that we used saw those margins. And then you can see the other categories there, seed, pest control, nutrients and such. And again, those are the easy ones to estimate. I wanna talk about machinery. Um, but before we do that, I wanna talk about rent. And what I've done here is showed you the NAS rents for 2016 backwards to 2008. You can see 
and they're by different crop reporting districts. Um, and so these are the southern three, south, central, southeast, southwest, and then we'll do the mid um, central ones and the northern ones. In the south where the lands are good for crop production, there really hasn't been a drop in rental rates. It's still creeping up between 2014 and 2016. They've been creeping up. This is the central district. You see the east central where there's a lot of that dairy land up there um, in um, east central Wisconsin. That's still going up, but we've seen some downward pressure in the west central and the central parts of the state. That's the that's the average of the whole crop reporting district. Um, northern areas are here in the northeast. It's still creeping up, but the other two are very flat. Now these are again averages. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of farmers that would love to be paying only um, you know $55 an acre for those areas. But you got to remember that goes all the way up to Lake Michigan, uh, or I'm sorry, Lake Superior. So it's the whole district average, and this is for all cropland. This isn't the best land. But what I really, the lesson I would like to really take from these um, three, and the next one here is um, irrigated land. There's a little downward pressure on rents, but in general, rents are coming up, and I expect with those negative margins, we don't see them going up as fast, and I expect them to soften and even come downward in most regions. Um, back to farm machinery costs now. This is the hard one to estimate. What you see here is um, there's a couple different ways to approach this. I'm gonna, the first one is estimating farm machinery costs from Iowa State University Extension. This is a detailed process where you sit down with the age of the machinery, what you paid for it, how long you expect to use it, what size of tractor you're using to pull it with. And you work through these um, sheets and you kind of go through the tables and get your number. Um, the other way to do it is I, you don't want to quite do that much work. It's just use the custom rates. There's a at Kansas State University, um, there's some people did a study back, it's been over, over 10 years ago now. But what they use is there's something called the Illinois, I'm sorry, the Kansas Farm Business Farm Management Association, and they take the data and a graduate student for his thesis essentially analyzed them, estimated cost of production, and then regressed them or related them to um, something we can observe, custom rates. And what he basically found is that the actual cost of production for most farmers for using that machinery is a little higher than the custom rate. And they go through various reasons why, um, but I made a little spreadsheet there, the simple method for machinery costs in Wisconsin. It's a very same, um, very simple idea here. We'll lay it out in the next slide here. Essentially what it says is as you get larger, your cost of production gets closer to the custom rate. Um, but for most farmers, and you can see the size there, it's probably 25 to 30% higher, 35% higher than the custom rate. So if you don't want to spend a lot of time estimating your farm machinery costs, take the custom rate, add 25 to 30, 35%. Um, and with a larger percent added if you're a smaller operation. Um, and if you're a bigger operation, um, you can get it smaller. But if you want to really know your cost of production, I really recommend going through that Iowa State tool. Um, it's got a lot of useful stuff there. And it's once you've done it once, it starts to go a lot faster. Um, Ted Bay is an extension agent over in the southwestern part of the state, and he's done it. And he says the first time is hard, and then you start going the other equipment, it goes much faster. Um, custom rate guides, the other thing is you need the custom rates. Wisconsin hasn't done it for a while. 2013 was the last one. And literally I got off the phone this morning with um, USDA NAS here in the state. They have a little bit of a state presence left. Um, and they would like to do another one, probably not till this fall. Um, but I looked at Iowa's custom rate guide from 2013, 2014, all the way up to 2016. And there's been very little change. Most of the machinery costs have remained relatively stable. A little up, a little down, depends on each one which specifics, but as a start, I think the 2013 isn't too bad. The last thing I wanna talk about is partial budgeting. And really what this is, is a, a tool that economists have developed or really farm managers have developed for just small changes or refinements in your farm operation. The key is it's a partial budget. You don't need the full budget. You only focus on the parts that change. You don't budget um, the full operation. You just need, um, you don't need the full budget is the key. And it's for fine tuning the operation. It's holding everything else fixed that doesn't change and just focus on a small change. So here's some examples. Um, you know, Do I um, plant rootworm BT corn or conventional corn with a soil insecticide? I'm currently doing the rootworm BT. Let's switch to um, conventional with the soil insecticide. Or what about maybe just taking on an extra 80 acres? Maybe do I rent that extra 80? Um, do I buy a combine or continue custom hiring? Do I sell my current tractor or, and buy a new one? Do I pay for a soil test for nitrogen? or just use credits. That's the kind of um, process it uses. So it's got a basic idea. And what it does is it asks you in a formal structured way to answer four questions. You have income gains and then you have income losses. What are the gains? First question there is what will be your new or added revenues as a result of this change you're looking at? The other one will be what costs will be reduced or eliminated? 
Then on the losses side, you're going to pick up some new costs. What are the new and added costs? Um, and then what revenues you're going to lose or are going to be reduced? So then what's the net benefit? Take the gain, subtract the costs, and that's your net gain. There's some tools here. I've got Iowa State University has a link there. Um, North Dakota State has a nice, um, they have a class actually, and you got some really good description there if you want a real full exp explanation of partial budgeting. I'll give you the gist of it here. It's often structured in this format like this in a little table, and it's the same four questions. What will be the new or added revenues? What will be the costs that'll be reduced or eliminated? What will be the new or added costs? What will be the revenues that'll be lost? And you just put them out on the table, fill them in, calculate total gains, total losses, take the difference. So we'll do an example here. Um, this is hypothetical. So we'll buy a planter, or am I gonna continue custom hiring for planting? So we'll assume a thousand acres, 500 of corn, 500 of soybeans. So what are my new revenues gonna be? I'm thinking higher yields for more timely planting. I'm getting my crop in when I want it, not when the um, custom planter can get there. Um, what's my costs are gonna be reduced? I'm no longer gonna be paying for custom hire, so that cost is gone. What am I gonna pick up for new costs? I'm gonna be paying the fixed and variable cost of that planter myself. And in revenues I, that are reduced, I couldn't think of any. And so we'll go through a hypothetical example here. So um, I'm thinking just as make nice round numbers for to illustrate the case here, three bushels extra corn. I'm gonna get my corn in a couple, three days earlier, maybe a week earlier than waiting for the um, custom planter to come in. Three bushels of corn at $3 a bushel at 500 acres, $4,500. I expect to get an extra bushel of soybeans at $9 a bushel at 500 acres, also $4,500. What are my costs that are being eliminated? You can see the custom planting there. I'm paying $20 an acre at, 10, at 500 acres, that's $10,000. Soybean planting is a little cheaper, it ends up being $8,000. Then on the other column there on the right, um, we get the additional costs. Um, we got corn, um, the cost to run that planter is about 15 bucks an acre. At 500 acres, $7,500. You can see the soybeans there, 12 bucks an acre to run the planter myself. Um, at 500 acres, $6,000. So you add them all up. You get 27,000 on the left here um, as the as the um, new the benefits really the gains, and then the losses of 13,500. Well, 27,000 minus 13,500 is 13,500. So that would be the net benefit. You can divide by 1,000 and get $13.50 an acre as your gain if you want it on a per acre basis. Of course, everything's all depends on this assumption. So a lot of times these are put into a spreadsheet. So will I really get three bushels? Maybe I'll only, I'll only get two. What does that do to everything? Or maybe it's not $3 corn, maybe it's 350 corn, et cetera. So it's really important to do sensitivity analysis and a spreadsheet makes it very useful. And it really also helps you figure out which assumptions are very critical. You can start playing with the price or you can start playing with the yield impact or whichever and start to see which of these variables is the most important um, that really drives my benefits. And those that seem most important, you spend a lot more time honing in and figuring out what's a very good estimate of that change. Um, here's another example here. Do I switch from custom hiring my herbicides for weed control or, or do I just do more tillage on my own and then do mecha mechanical weed control, you know, cultivation like we used to do back in the day. Um, additional revenues, I couldn't think of any. Um, uh, what costs are reduced? custom hiring my herbicides. I'm assuming this case here is 300 acres. Um, so I'm spending $40 an acre for the application and the active ingredients, the herbicides. So that's $12,000. I know if I switch this, make this switch, I'm no longer paying that. So that 12,000 is gone, but I'm gonna pick up these additional costs. I'm gonna lose some revenues here. Um, I'm gonna do extra tillage and cultivation for mechanical weed control. I'm assuming $10 plus $5 an acre for the everything for the um, cultivation. So at 300 acres, that's $4,500. I'm also expecting more yield loss that um, the, the cultivation isn't as effective. I'm gonna expect 4% at 150 bushel per acre corn, $3 a bushel at 300 acres, that's $5,400. Doing this, these numbers, you get 12,000 in gains, avoided costs for those fertilizer or uh, herbicides and um, additional costs are 9,900. My net gain or net benefit is $2,100 divided by 300 acres, about seven bucks an acre. Now you can start playing with this. Is this really making sense? How crucial is this cost assumptions? How crucial is my yield loss assumptions? Um, you can start playing with that and thinking about it. So in summary then, the farm economy is under stress. I went through several examples of national level data and some Wisconsin data to show that. And anyone who's in agriculture knows that, but I've been emphasizing that with different people I've talked to around the state that are not in agriculture or are, are tied to the state or are tied to agriculture. 
Um, simple examples of a marketing plan. I showed you some. Ed Usset provides some very good um, farmer-friendly stuff. If you want to learn more and be more sophisticated, I strongly encourage you to do the UW Extension program there. You'll learn a lot about what's going on there. In the past, some of the county agents have run marketing groups to help farmers learn these principles with each other. Um, then I went through knowing your cost of production and how it's actually very important. Um, and it's, I can't, I can give you an average, but you really want to know is your cost of production. Um, and I think I showed you some cost UW extension materials out there. You can make your own. I think machinery is the hardest part. It's roughly 25% of the custom rate, or you can go through the detailed tools and estimate your machinery costs. Next one is partial budgeting. That's the last thing I did. Answer those four questions in a formal, structured way, and it'll help you understand whether a, a tinkering with your um, operation will be a way to reduce your costs or increase your profits, which I think in this low margin year would be a very good time to think about some of those tools. Thanks for your attention. Um, if you have any questions about this, you know, feel free to contact me. My contact information is there. Thank you.